people have some very strong convictions about the translation that they read and with good cause, but I think there's an underlying issue that we don't always understand how those translations have come about. And I certainly have been very guilty of choosing tradition over choice. So let's dive in to these translations. And can we just like right off the bat, agree to disagree on some of these things? Is that even something that happens on the internet anymore? Like we could really have an opportunity to bring that back. Well, hello friend, I'm Mary Beth with At What Cost, where we are learning to apply God's truth to our everyday lives. And here on our Study Tip Sundays, we're gonna dive in to a Bible topic. And you may be asking yourself, don't we usually talk about family minimalism? Yes, we do. Our Friday video is focused more on family minimalism and how we can actually apply God's truths in our everyday tasks. On Sundays though, I wanna encourage you to explore your faith. I want you to gain confidence in understanding your beliefs and convictions so that you too can learn to apply God's truths in a way that feels right for you and and brings glory and honor to God. So it is entirely possible for you to have grown up in the church, be very involved in your church community, and yet never have actually picked up a Bible to use for your own personal study. That is not an uncommon thing around modern Christians today. So when we do make the choice to engage in that personal study and actually pick up our Bibles, which translation should we choose? Would it surprise you to know that there are over 900 translations or paraphrases of the Bible into English? That was kind of a shocker for me, especially because we really only hear about a handful of them. So over the next few weeks, we're gonna talk about how we get those thousand different translations from one original Hebrew or Greek text. Today, we are gonna talk about the three kind of core ways or intentions that we can have with a Bible translation or paraphrase. And this information is coming out of a book that I read, it was so helpful in understanding scripture and kind of just the functionality, the, di the different dynamics, translations, just so many questions have been answered through this book. And it is by R.C. Sproul. It is called Knowing Scripture. So I will put a link down in the description below to this resource, but I highly recommend this book. If you are just curious about Bible translations and scripture in general, and all of the different dynamic elements of that. I think it's important for us to really think about this concept in an intellectual way so that we can make an informed decision. So the first way is with formal equivalents. So this version translates the original Hebrew or Greek, depending on whether you are in the Old Testament or the New Testament, as closely as possible to the word by word translation. Now, this method can be very accurate when it comes to the verbal translation of the scripture but you may find that it is a little bit cumbersome in its readability it may feel a little less like a natural flow of vocabulary for you in just your everyday reading so some examples of this style of translation would be the new american standard bible and the new king james version so that is formal equivalence. So the equivalent word is used. The next style of translation is functional equivalence or dynamic equivalence. So the goal behind this is more about readability. This translation is really balancing the tension between 
maximizing the flow of readability while eliminating or minimizing as much distortion as possible from the original text. So this is a more thought by thought translation. They tend to feel a little easier to read because again, the intention is to maximize readability. Examples of this style of translation would be the new revised standard version and the new international version. The next style of translation is going to be the paraphrase or free translation. The intention in this translation is to more modernize the language and elaborate on the thoughts to really get to that level of maximum readability. The caution here is that the further we get into paraphrasing or free translation, the greater the potential there may be for distortion of the text. Some examples of this paraphrase translation are the New Living Translation or The Message. So that is the very basic overview of the intentions behind three of the main ways that the original collection of our ancient scriptures that have been preserved over thousands of years were written by various and many authors that have just come together to give us one complete scripture that has been preserved for us to study and read even today. And I know that Bible translations can get us pretty fired up. And for good reason, the translation that we read really can guide and direct the way that we understand the character of God. And so it can have a very deep impact on our faith. And I am just going to go ahead and put this out there before we get any further into this discussion on Bible translations, that no translation or paraphrase is perfect. Not even the two that I did not mention today. You know what they are. So next week, we are going to talk more about the underlying text that are used when they're translated into the English language, and those vary by translations. So be sure to subscribe if you have not already, and I will see you here every Friday for a family minimalism video and every Sunday for another study tip Sunday. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.